Mecca. And I thought, wait a minute, why would Israel return to Mecca? And listen to this, because you're going to be interested. I'm just going to turn him loose. Why would Israel return to Mecca? Because God says so. God says in Deuteronomy 11, he says, your borders will go from the Great Sea, the Mediterranean, to the Euphrates River, that's east-west, and from Lebanon in the north, south, to the desert. What's the desert? The desert is not the Negev, which was the tribe of Judah. It is not the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, because that was always pharaonic. The great and horrible desert, as it is described in the Bible, is the Arabian Desert. And you all should be knowing about the phylacteries. This is the garba like shape that they put on their arms and their forehead. So I want him, this uh, A.V. Lipkin, to talk about this, and I'll explain some aspects of this. But this is known amongst the Jews that they wear this cube on their forehead, and they wear it also on their arms, okay? And so this is the phylactery. So this is what he will be talking about. This is very important to understand, dear brothers and sisters, okay? So let me now just explain this in his words. So, but it's something, it's in Matthew 23, verse 5. So we know that the Jewish men in those days wore this. We know that in the Greek Orthodox Christian tradition, there are priests who put on phylacteries. It's a slightly different Greek phylactery, but it all commemorates exactly the same thing. So the phylacteries have a very important meaning for Christians as well. So my question, and I'll ask... Uh, and by the way, this Jewish man has written a book called Return to Mecca, right? Uh, so it's the Jewish return back to Mecca. This is what Dijal is all about. It's about taking over the predefined borders given in the Bible by force. Uh, essentially, that's the only way to do it. Now... Good for everybody who's watching. Why in the world would you put on a uh, strap a little wooden box with the scriptures from Deuteronomy on the inside and attach that to your left arm and to your forehead? Why would why would you do that? And why would it be cube cube shaped, perfectly cube shaped? And so the contention in my book is that when Moses came to Pharaoh, and Ph remember Pharaoh was God. Pharaoh was God in Egypt to the Egyptian people. He created the Nile, and he created this, and he created that. Who's Moses? Moses is a guy who stutters. It's very hard to talk. And God says, give the people a sign. And the phylacteries were the sign. He gave Pharaoh the signs. You remember his rod became a, uh, a crocodile or serpent, ate the other crocodiles. Right. And, uh, By the way, I just want to mention as a point that many of the ulama, traditional ulama, who study al-mulkalam, they say that the prophets have to actually be perfect in speech because their job is to convey the message. And it defeats the purpose that you're not able to talk, to, that you're given the message to be conveyed and you can't talk. So of course he had Harun والسلام, to help him. But if Musa is given a job, that means he should be able to do it. And that's why the Quran mentions the dua, Rabbi shahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. That if there was an impediment in the uh, conversation of Musa والسلام, it was removed after the dua that he did mentioned in the Quran in Surah Taha. Okay, that's just a very side point, but <clears throat> these are the, the, the leprosy or in the chest, these are all signs. That, and then later, the ten plagues, um, and Moses gave signs to the elders of Israel, and Moses gave signs to the people. You're talking about primitive pagan people who are shepherds. And they're saying to Moses, well, why should we listen to you? You know, and so God, so this uh, phylactery has four pouches, four parchments. Uh, so phylactery is the Kaaba shaped thing they put on their forehead and their arm. First two are Exodus 13. Then you have Deuteronomy <coughs> 6 and Deuteronomy 11. One day I'll talk about why these four are in the in that pouch of the cube. Okay, so the Exodus 13, we are still in Egypt. We are still in slavery. We're about to flee. But Exodus 13 talks about the, you know, sign on thy arm and frontless between thine eyes. And, I, you know, I know young people won't know the word that I'm going to say now, but there's a word that older people like you and I remember, which is, you know, you know gyroscope. A gyroscope takes us directly in the direction we have to go. 
and Moses is leading the children of Israel out of the pyramid triangular system to the cubic square system of freedom in the desert. And again, which they will not admit we already have, but they want to replace it with themselves. We're not the people of the of the of the triangular or the pyramid. We are the people of the square, you can say, if you put it that way. Uh, Moses says to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may circle me in the desert. The other five times, let my people go so that they may serve the Lord. <coughs> the first one is they should go around in circles. Now, Hajj is a pilgrim to Mecca. Hag is the Egyptian pronunciation. Hag in Hebrew means a holiday or going around in circles. And afterwards, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast. Now, over here, I want you to remember, what happens after Hajj? There's a feast, right? So that they may hold a feast. But the word is Hag. And Hag means Hajj, as well as feast. But it also means to go around in circle. So keep this in mind. The word in Hebrew is hag. Okay. Uh, similar to the Arabic word hajj. And you can see the, uh, the Hebrew and the Arabic together here. Uh, hajj. To betake oneself or, uh, or to an object of reverence with pilgrimage to Mecca. Same word means to make a pilgrimage, keep a, a pilgrimage feast. So essentially Exodus 5.1 can be read as following. Afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus said it the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a pilgrimage, or that they ho may hold a feast. Unto me in the wilderness, in the desert. Hmm, wonder where that is. This should be a reason for Jews to accept Islam, not to oppose Islam. But if you're a Zionist, then you're only going to see everything through a Zionist view. Rather than realizing, wait, maybe the message, the true message is with the people who actually hold Makkah. Maybe that what Moses wanted is being done by the Muslims from the other side of the same family. The same word is used in Exodus 12, 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a hajj, or hag, or a feast, or a pilgrimage to the Lord throughout your generations. Interesting, the word hag can also be interpreted as a festival sacrifice. A feast, of course, to have feast in those days, you had to do sacrifice. And as you can see here, a festival sacrifice. And the word is Hag. Muslims to this day perform annual sacrifice at the occasion of Hajj to, com commemorate, uh, to commemorate the events that took place in the blessed life of Prophet Ibrahim Hag in Hebrew means a holiday or going around in circles. Or going around in circles. The same word, hag, astonishingly means to a circle or to draw a circle, to grow into, go into a circle. So the same word means pilgrimage, feast, going in circle. And it says in the Bible that Jesus... Or going around in circles. Or going around in circles. And it is just another coincidence that they strap phylacteries is wound around their arms seven times. The strap is wound seven times around the arm. <coughs> so, now what I want to do from here is to share with you other intellectuals besides this man who have who have said the same thing. Okay? Other people, other intellectuals in, in the Muslim Jewish world that have said, yes, Jews 
were in Arabia. They were in Mecca and Medina. And we know Jews were in Medina. That's a fact. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And they used to go to Mecca. Because the, we know that the Jews used to come and talk to the people of Quraysh. So they used to go to Mecca. But they were waiting for a Prophet to come and take over Arabia. So inshallah, in, in, now from here, uh, my lecture will start and explain this in more detail and the consequences of this, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, assalamu alaykum. And so now, inshallah, I'm continuing. Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasul al-kareem. Amma ba'd fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qala azza wa jal fi muhkam al-tanzil. Walamma jaa'ahum kitabun min indi allahi musaddiqan lima ma'ahum. وكانوا من قبل يستفتحون على الذين كفروا فلما جاءهم ما عرفوا كفروا به فلعنة الله على الكافرين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين يا رب There is this verse in the Quran that I want to talk about today that talks about the relationship between the Arab world and the Jewish world. And this concept provided in the Quran has a great consequence on our present and future times. So I want to start with the translation of the verse. وَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ كِتَابٌ مِّنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ And when the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to them, meaning the Qur'an. مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَهُمْ Confirming that which they had. وَكَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ يَسْتَفْتِهُونَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And these Jewish people in Medina, they used to, they used to give them the tidings or the news of a victory. Meaning a prophet will come, and they assumed the Prophet would be Jewish. And we will defeat you when he comes. When he comes, we will defeat you. But he happened to be an Arab from the other side of the same family. From the side of Ismail. So the, the Jewish people in Medina used to say, when a Prophet comes, we will defeat you. So the Jewish people have always looked for a Prophet and are looking for a Prophet, looking for a Messiah, a Mashiach who is going to conquer the Arabs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمَّا جَاهُمْ كِتَابٌ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ When a book came to them from Allah, what did this book do for them? مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَهُمْ It confirmed all the things that they knew to be true, the Qur'an confirmed for them. Okay? So the English translation we have here is, when a scripture came to them from Allah, confirming that they have, although previously they were وَكَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ يَسْتَفْتِهُونَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And they were seeking victory against those who disbelieved. Over here, kafaru means the people of Quraysh. فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ مَا عَرَفُوا When that came to them which they recognized, oh, this is the truth. And this is that prophet that we were told about in our books. And their own books confirm us and our books confirm him. كَفَرُوا بِهِ They denied him. فَلَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ So Allah is, cur Allah is curse or Allah takes away His mercy from the ones who deny the truth. So, <coughs> why, are the Jewish, why were the Jewish people interested in a prophet that would conquer the Arabs? This is one question I'm leaving you with, but now I want to go on to another side of the same question. And that is that the Jewish people consider the desert, the, the desert, the, the area called Arabia, Rubul Khali, the empty quarter. They consider the desert, including Mecca and Medina, part of the borders of Israel. I'm going to show this to you. But first, let me share with you some of the intellectual history uh, around this issue and why it has such an impact today. 
So, the first book was written about almost 200 years ago called Arabia Petria. Okay? Uh, this book talks about how Jewish history is much more richer in the desert, in the outer world, than it is in the area of Palestine or what is today called Israel. It's much more rich. And uh, this uh, fellow, his name is Mosil. Uh, let me get a better picture of him here. This man, Mosil, he was, I think, a British man. Uh, but he spent a lot of time in Arabia and he wrote this book about Jewish history in Arabia. Okay, just follow along with what I'm saying for a little bit and then you'll see where I'm taking this. Then another book was written in 1921 called The Relations Between the Arabs and Israelites Prior to the Rise of Islam. This book also discusses this issue from the perspective of how rich the history of the Jews is in the Arab lands. And amongst the Arab lands, most rich in Yemen. Okay. And then, <coughs> I think this is a, somebody sent me actually a text clarifying what this says. But the Jews in Mecca, uh, from the time of David or something like this. But this is another book that has been written on this subject. So let me give you the exact translation. This is actually in German, the brother sent to me. The title of the book is The Israelites at Mecca from David's Time to the 5th Century. A contribution to the Old Testament. And then it continues from there. Okay? So, thank you for the brother that did that. May Allah reward you. So, the Israelites in Mecca. Meaning, we know Ibrahim was in Mecca. Right? So, all these books are being written, have been written, about the place of the Jews in Arabia. Uh, there are YouTube uh, programs in which people go around in Israel asking Jews, do you know what Khaybar is? Do you know about the Jews in Arabia? Do you know about the Kaaba that Ibrahim والسلام, built? Okay. So, it is well known to the Arabs that they have, and uh, is well known to the Jewish people. Uh, this is also one of the writers who's written a lot about this, Hugo Winkler. Um, and uh, let me just now continue here. This is a book written by a Muslim scholar, actual, actually, uh, Dr. Jawad Ali. He's written Al Mufassil fi Tariq al Arab, the ex extended, you know, uh, explanation of the history of the Arabs قبل Islam, before Islam. This is in 10 volumes. This book also explains the role of Judaism and uh, the, the Israelites in Arabia. Um, this also explains in great detail how much their involvement was in the desert. Okay. And you'll see where all this is going, inshallah. This is another book on the same topic called Mu'jam Geografiya Fi Balad Al Arabiya Al Saudiya. Aliya Najad wrote this, and the meaning of this title is Al Mu'jam, the dictionary, Al Geografia of the Geography, Lil Bilad Al Arabiya Al Saudiya, for the land of the Arabs Al Saudiya. Okay, Aliya Najad wrote this book. Okay, and uh, it's quite an extensive book, it's about 1,300 pages or so. And this book also. Uh, shows the deep relationship the Israelites had with Arabia. And so this is why we find that what? That the Prophet ﷺ was in Arabia and the Jews were in Arabia. And the Jews 
were in Arabia for a reason. One of the reasons was that they were expecting a prophet there. That's why they moved to Medina. There were Jews in Rome. There were Jews in different parts of the world, but a large a part of their history actually has to do with the desert. And so, why this becomes meaningful today, you will see, inshallah, in a short while. This is another book. It's called The Bible Came from Arabia. Uh, this has been actually translated from, I think, Arabic. Uh, Bible Came from Arabia. And uh, the Arabic version of it that became very popular by the same author. The word is not Bible, but At-Tawrah Ja'a Min Jaziratul Arab. The Tawrat came from Jaziratul Arab. Okay? And... Uh, And so, the, what is the idea behind this? The idea behind this is that the Jewish involvement in Arabia, in the Arabian Peninsula, in the, um, is, is much more than what people may be thinking, that just some few group of Jews came to Arabia. No, their, their involvement in Arabia has been from the time of Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam, till... Uh, till the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu They were in Arabia and 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 that has that it has big consequences. Uh, let me also show you this uh, person. Uh, he has written several books on this subject, particularly on Surya in Syria. Uh, As Surya Wa'udatu Zaman al Arabi, Dr. Ahmed Daoud. Dr. Ahmed Daoud uh, has written many books of the uh, Israelites in Yemen, in Syria, in Arabia. In fact, he thinks the exodus didn't even happen in Egypt. He thinks it happened in Yemen. But uh, we will talk about that at another time. <coughs> uh, here's another book on the subject. Geographia at Torah, the geography. And this author, by the way, Ziad Manni, has also written many books. Uh, he's written Geographia at Torah, the geography of the Torah, Misr wa Banu Israel, okay, uh, Egypt and Banu Israel uh, before the uh, you know the Exodus and all that. Okay, so uh, he also has talked about how the Jewish people were actually in Arabia, and that the uh, the Mount Tur and Sinai that has been mentioned in the Quran is also in Arabia and not where we say it is uh, generally today. Uh, just uh, a couple more examples. Uh, the Arabian Bible, okay, uh, or the Torah in 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 the Bible, a Torah ja min Jaziratul Arab, okay. The Torah came from Jazirat al-Arab, from the Arabian Peninsula. Here's another book that's been written on the subject. Uh, it is called The Geography of Torah and Its Arab Rabbis. Okay. So, uh, this is very interesting. The Arab Rabbis and the Geography of the Torah. Uh, and where were the different rabbis? And you can imagine what this book goes into. Uh, where is all this leading us is going to be uh, very important, okay? And what are the political consequences of this? The rise and, file, file, fall, rise and fall of a Jewish kingdom in Arabia, okay? And uh, then you have archaeologists claim Mount Sinai found in Saudi Arabia. We can deal with that at another time. Okay, so now I want to give you the, uh, you can say the definition of what is Israel in the Jewish definition. Okay, a slightly more de detailed definition is given in Exodus 23:31. This is their Exodus which describes the borders from the Red Sea 
to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. Okay, so I want you to understand this, that when it says from the desert to the Euphrates River, what is it talking about? It's talking about Jazirat al-Arab. It is talking about Arabia, which includes Mecca and Medina. And so the Jewish ideology, the religious Jewish ideology, and the Christian Jewish messianic ideology is that this whole area must be under the the footsteps of the Jews okay now there are other opinions about what the word desert means but they are very aware of the idea of what of the desert being Arabia okay I'm going to just move on right now and then come back to some of these the consequences of these points that I'm mentioning okay so we'll deal with this a little bit later let me just make this point now that the Jews were waiting for a prophet to conquer the Arabs the Jews are still waiting for a prophet to conquer the Arabs known as the Masih who will restore the Jewish kingdom he will be the king of the Jews. And he will bring, according to them, Jews to their destiny, to their fate. That was always meant to be. And he will rule over this desert and these border areas from the Euphrates to the Nile, from, uh, from where they are today in Israel to all of Syria and Yemen. Okay? So, <clears throat> now let me make my next point is that the person who founded uh, Israel his name was uh, Herzl now Herzl this guy that founded Israel he was not a religious guy he didn't believe in God but he exploited the religion for the purposes of the uh, of, of bringing Jews to Israel and this is something that was not just it, of course they were doing things at the political level with Britain with other countries with the US they were doing things with other countries to establish the state of Israel but they were also exploiting the belief system their religion to bring people from other parts of the world from Russia, from Ethiopia, wherever. They were exploiting people from different parts of the world, from Iran, the different Jews to come to Israel. Okay? So, when you have see the Abrahamic Accords, and you see that they're making a lot of political endeavors, they're trying to get along politically, when you see that they're, um, Saudi Arabia is reaching out to Israel because of its technology and so on and so forth, Keep in mind that Israelis are not only interested in the political aspect of its peace, but they're also interested because they know in their intellectual circles. And they talk about this in their intellectual circle, circles. They write about this in their journals. That Arabia is one of the places of their borders. And the Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. And that Saudi Arabia is one of their historical sites that one day is promised to them. This is particularly important in the light of the fact that they've been excavating, excavating, excavating all of Israel and they found very little proof of their existence in that land we call Israel. They found more proof that the Romans were there than the Jews were there. They've been excavating all around Aqsa. In fact, let me see if I can show that to you. And then I'll come back to this. UNESCO votes no connection between Temple Mount and Judaism. Because they weren't able to, after all of their almost 50-60 years of digging 
they weren't able to show any real substantial proof that they had any long-term existence in Jerusalem. Seems like they were mostly living in Yemen and would go to Jerusalem and come back to Yemen or something like this. Allah knows best. But UNESCO even voted no connection between the Temple Mount and Judaism. This may have another purpose behind it, which is that, okay, we haven't found Jewish artifacts, history in the area of Israel, but we're finding a lot of artifacts and history in Yemen and in Arabian Peninsula. So therefore, what? Once they've established Israel is their right because it's their land, well, it's their land because Abraham gave it to them or his footsteps were there or because God gave them these borders, well, why does the same not apply to Yemen and in Jazirat al-Arab? Just as today Israel has Israel because of the religious belief that God gave them this land, why will this not apply later on to Arabia and Yemen if they say, well, we didn't find our artifacts here, but we are finding them in Yemen and we are finding them in Arabia. So what stops us from claiming that that is ours? Nothing. And in fact, they have. They have claimed that Arabia is theirs. They have claimed that they're going to conquer Mecca and Medina. If I get a chance, I will show you today. So UNESCO has said the Temple Mount uh, has no signs of Jewish presence any time in history. Okay. Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque in danger of collapsing due to Israeli excavation work because they've been digging all around it and all they keep finding is Roman coins, Roman things, Roman, because this was actually a Roman fort. Okay. I don't want to go into that. If somebody wants to, they can see my discussions on Al-Aqsa and the Temple Mount and where is the real Temple Mount versus where they're trying to say where the Temple Mount is. So they're not going to find anything in this place. <coughs> Israel plans excavations near Al-Aqsa Mosque. Okay, So they want to bring down Al-Aqsa Mosque and they want excavations there. That's what they're going to do. Okay, They're going to try to force to find something. What is the Jewish belief about the Mes Mes Masih? One of the things is, he is going to re-establish their borders. He's going to re-establish the state of Israel. He's going to be the king of this whole area called the uh, greater Israel, you can say, or what they call Israel. Okay. Now, let me show you from the, we started from the ayah of the Quran. Let me go back to that. And then I'll tell you about the consequences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمَّا جَاءُمْ كِتَابٌ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ and when came to them the book from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, confirming that which they already had, كانوا وكانوا من قبل. and before they were what? يستفتحون. They were saying, we will have victory over you. على الذين كفروا, to the people of Quraysh. And to the people that were pagans. فَلَمَّا جَاءُمْ مَا عَرَفُوا When that came to them which they knew about, a prophet came to them as described to them in the books. And the Prophet came to them confirming which they have in their books, their teachings. Their, their, the, they saw, oh, this is what our books were saying. Those who deny this now, they deny it because he's not from their family. So Allah takes away his mercy from the people who deny the truth. Okay. Now that's the ayah. And that tells you that the because they didn't believe in Prophet Muhammad, just like they were waiting for the Messiah and the Messiah came. Jesus, peace be upon him. Jesus, peace be upon him came. They denied Jesus. And they were still waiting for the Messiah. And then they were waiting for a prophet to come in Arabia. The prophet in Arabia came who would conquer the Arabs and he conquered the Arabs. But they still denied him. Now they're still waiting for the Messiah. So now the, they're still waiting on their Messiah, right? And that Messiah will end up being the false Messiah who will conquer the Arabs in the name of this is all Israel. This is all part of our land and our territory. So, now let us go back to the sayings of the Prophet Wasallam on this issue. The Prophet said Wasallam, 
Yemen will be conquered and some people will migrate from Medina and will urge their families and those will uh, and those who will obey them to migrate to Al Yemen even though Al Medina will be better for them. Why will they conquer Yemen? Because that's part of their plan. That's where their heritage is. And I'm going to show this to you even better in just a little bit. But if Medina is better for them if they did, but no. Sham will be conquered, as I showed you the author who wrote about the history of the Jews in Surya, in Sham. Sham will be conquered and some people migrate from Medina and urge their families and those who will obey them to migrate to Sham, although Medina will be better for them if they did, but no. Iraq will be better it conquered and some people will migrate from Medina and urge their families, remember, all the way till the Euphrates, so that includes Iraq, and those who will obey them to migrate to Iraq, although Medina will be better for them if they did but know. And I wish to send a message to the people of Medina that don't leave Medina, no matter how bad the ride gets. No matter how bad the situation gets, don't leave Medina. Medina will be better for you and your families in the future. You're going to leave Medina because there will be no jobs in Medina. There will be no jobs in Medina because the government will stop functioning. The, the normal amenities you get, water and food and drink and cars, and they'll be gone. But Medina will be better if you did but know. Okay? And so there's another narration of the Prophet wasallam, which I'll share with you now, in which the Prophet said, Sallallahu <coughs> Imran al-Bayt al-Maqdas kharab al-Yathrib That the rise of Jerusalem, and this is now where their capital is, and why is the whole Arab bowing down to Israel right now? Because they have technology. Uh, they have the most patents in the world right now. They are the number three company. in. Uh, they have the number third most companies in the NASDAQ. They're the... They're the the foremost in cybersecurity and biotechnology. So the Saudi Arabia knows or feels that oil is not going to be very helpful for it in the future. And they're bowing down to Israel to make peace so they can avail from that technology, from that know-how. And so what is that? That's the rise of Jerusalem. But what is happening inside without the Arab world realizing or without MBS realizing it is that is actually the destruction of Medina okay and this is exactly the problem again is that rather than relying on your own Muslims for technology you're relying on others yet again and trust me that does not bring good consequences okay and so let me share with you the third narration I want to show with you show you so <coughs> the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Dajjal will come to Medina and find angels guarding it. Okay? So Allah's willing, neither the Dajjal nor the plague will be able to come near it. Okay? So since uh, COVID-19 went into Medina, we know that it's not a real plague. But in the same way, the Dajjal will make it look like he entered Medina, but he will not be able to enter Medina. He will bring the people from the city of Medina, entice them to come out to him. But the point being here is that when the Jal comes, he's going to try to conquer these lands. And he is going to conquer these lands, but he won't be able to enter Mecca and Medina. And that will be a clear sign he's the Jal. Now let me also share with you what will be some possible causes of this is mentioned in another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, The people will flee from Dijjal such that they will go to the mountains. And then it was asked from the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Where will the Arabs be that day? And the Prophet said, They will be few. They will be few. Now let me read some of these narrations in the original Arabic. لا يفرقن ناس من الدجال. The people will run away, flee from the Jal, Hatta Yulhaku Bijibad until they attach themselves to the mountains. Qalat Umm Sharik Umm Sharik 
رضي الله عنها she said, she said يا رسول الله فأين العرب يوم إذن where will the Arabs be that day هم قليل the Prophet said صلى الله عليه وسلم they will be so few هم قليل they will be few now they will be few in what sense some bomb is going to come some nuclear bomb is going to come and only a few Arabs will be left or the Jewish army will be bigger and the Arabs will be few they can't fight there will be only a few or hum qalil in sense of power, metaphorically. But anyway, you have to put other ahadiths together to get the fuller picture, which I'm not going into today because I only want to focus on one point. But one side point that you may enjoy is this hadith by Imam uh, uh, the Imam Tirmizi. Okay? Uh, he says, after writing this hadith, <coughs> هذا حديث حسن سيه. Now this is something very, you say, you can say unique to Imam Tirmizi. But he used to like to. He didn't say it's Hasan good in Sahih. Sahih means it's absolutely authentic. Hasan means it's a good, it's reliable hadith. Especially if you can combine other ahadiths saying the same thing. So he had this special terminology, which scholars have debated about. Different meanings, some have given up to 20 different meanings of what Hasanun Sahihun or means or other variations of this uh, language that Imam Tirmizi uses. But this is a very authentic hadith. Okay? In another narration, the Prophet said, Sallallahu the one that I just read to you, Al Madina tu Ya'tiha al Dijjal. Dijjal will come to Medina. Fayyajidu al Malaika tu Yahrisunaha. He will find the malaika, the angels guarding it. فَلَيَكْرِبُونَهَا الدِّجَّالِ And Dijjal will not come near it. وَقَالْ وَلَا تَعُونْ Nor any, uh, any uh, uh, plague will enter Medina. Insha'Allah, by the will of Allah. So, uh, <coughs> Dijjal will want to come to Medina. He will want to conquer Medina. But he won't be able to enter Medina. In the next hadith, uh, Imran al Bayt al Maqdas, Kharab al Yathrib. The building of Jerusalem will be the destruction. When you see the building of and tall buildings in Israel and they feel secure and peace, to when prosperity will be in Israel, in Jerusalem. That will be the sign of the destruction of Medina. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yuftihu al-Yaman. Yemen will be conquered. Fa'ya'ti qawman yubussuna. And a people will come migrating over there from Medina. فَيَتَحَمَّلُونَ بِأَهْلِهِمْ مَنْ أَطَاعَهُمْ And they will carry with them the people who obey them. وَالْمَدِينَةُ خَيْرٌ لَهُمْ And Medina will be better for them. لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ If they did but know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep the people in Medina in Medina. Then the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَيُفْتِحُ الشَّامِ And Syria will be conquered. فَيَعْتِ قَوْمٌ Yubusuna, then a people will come migrating for their jobs. Okay. And they will bring their families with them and whoever obeys them. And Medina will be better for them if they did but know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep the people in Medina today in Medina. وَيُفْتِحُ الْإِرَاقِ And Iraq will also be conquered. فَيَعْتِ قَوْمًا يُبُسُّونَ وَيَتَحَمَّلُونَ بِأَحْلِهِمْ وَمَنْ أَطَاءَهُمْ And the people of Iraq will be conquered and people will leave Medina to go to Iraq for their jobs, bring their families and whoever obeys them. وَالْمَدِينَةُ خَيْرٌ لَهُمْ Even though Medina will be better for them, لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ If they did but know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep the people in Medina steadfast and in Medina and not to go to Yemen and Iraq and Syria. Ameen. Allahumma ameen. But what is the meaning of all of this? 
the meaning of all of this is that if you give in to the conditions of Israel, they are going to backstab the Arabs and the Muslims in the end. Why are they going to backstab the Muslims in the end? Because they believe, as part of their religion, that the land of Mecca and Medina and the land of Arabia is theirs. They believe this to be an intellectually true fact. They believe that they will conquer Arabia one day. Now let me just share with you this video. And I thought, wait a minute, why would Israel return to Mecca? And listen to this, because you're going to be interested. I'm just going to turn him loose. Why would Israel return to Mecca? Because God says so. God says in Deuteronomy 11, he says, your borders will go from the Great Sea, the Mediterranean, to the Euphrates River, that's east-west, and from Lebanon in the north, south, to the desert. What's the desert? The desert is not the Negev which was the tribe of Judah. It is not the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, because that was always pharaonic. The great and horrible desert, as it is described in the Bible, is the Arabian desert. And what this book shows is that the children of Israel spent 38 or almost you know, close to 40 years in the Arabian desert in their wanderings before they turned north, Deuteronomy 2, verse 2, says enough being encompassed around this mountain, Mount Sinai, head north to the land of the Amorites. And so that's going to be our new border. And that would have included the areas now known as Mecca and Medina. Correct. And so they actually set foot on this soil. Wherever your feet will tread will be yours. And, and yeah, I, I was going to have you talk about that because that's a promise <coughs> that God made to Israel. Wherever your foot shall touch the ground. And by the way, I think people are beginning to learn, finally, and it's been a slow process. They're beginning to learn that uh, uh, Mount Sinai is not in the Sinai Peninsula. It's in what used to be called the land of Midian, over on the eastern shore of the Red Sea, not far, I guess, from the Gulf of Eilat, uh, and then moving on inland to uh, contemporary Mecca and Medina, the the uh, the feet of the Israelites during 40 years of wandering covered that whole territory. And you're saying that the Islamic leaders are familiar with the promises God made to Israel and they would like to forestall all of those promises. Or to completely avoid them by killing all the Jews and Christians who pose that threat to them. An amazing, amazing concept. If you'd like... And yeah, as if... They would not kill to get their religious land like the way they didn't kill to get uh, Israel in the first. They didn't kill anyone, right, to to get uh, the current Israel. And they're not going to kill anyone in the future. They're going to actually leave it only in the hands of God and trust him. I doubt that very much, looking at their history. So that is one aspect that I wanted to share with you. I kill the Jews on Saturday, Christians on Sunday, Hindus, Buddhists, and blacks any day, and then the Muslims kill each other. You know, it's called projecting, putting your own vicious ideas in, and projecting it on somebody else. That's We want to kill Jews on Saturday and Christians on Sunday. Other In the name of their God, with a small g, Allah, who I say is Satan, wants to kill every human being because we're in the image of God. Yeah, and so here's, uh, you know, some political, uh, is, he's a very big political leader in Israel, uh, saying Allah is Satan. This is what this guy who's running the major, one of the major political parties in Israel is saying about Islam. Uh, Allah is Satan. And Muslims want to do Abrahamic Accords. And our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, does not wish the death of any of his children, of any human beings. And the battle about Mecca and Medina and Jerusalem is, if they get Jerusalem, we all die, including them. And if we get Mecca and Medina, we all win. The Muslims all Now, we, if we get Mecca and Medina, what does that mean? Is that going to happen without bloodshed? That's just going to happen like with a, you know, like a wand. Somebody says, okay, well, you know, I made this happen. What, that's not going to happen without, that's not going to, that's going to happen without bloodshed? Also win with us because they will be freed of their chains of slavery and, and uh, 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 the chains of Allah 
just like the Nazis, when they when this Nazism was destroyed, the Germans were blessed in 1945, and the Japanese were blessed when Tojo fascism was banned. The Muslims are good people, but you got to ban that crazy system. Very interesting. So anything to get their land with any justification, sugarcoat it as much as you want. And, uh, you know, this is the thing that the falsehood always wraps, its, wraps itself around some tr something that sounds true or something that sounds factual. Anyway, that's it for another time. <coughs> but it should be clear to any Muslim after today that they definitely plan to take over Makkah and Medina. So I want to ask uh, the leaders of the Arab world, why is that not part of the conversation? Why are we becoming less religious and they're allowed, and, and because we're less religious, we have to be more hands-off and more secular and they are becoming more religious. And why should we not assume since they're allowed, you know, I had a rabbi say to me, I don't know, about 15 years ago, a rabbi said to me that the Israeli neighborhood that she lived in was very secular in the 80s. But when she went back after 9-11, and she said, my whole neighborhood became religious. So there's a rise of religious ideas in Israel. Relies, uh, 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 the uh, religious ideas are rising in Hindu nationalism, in Christian nationalism, like with Trumpism. And they want Trumpism in Israel. Okay, that's what they want, because that's the only way that they're going to be able to succeed in convincing their population to go ahead with these ideas of genocide that they have planned for the Arabs, which the Prophet told us that there will be only a few Arabs. So, don't be fooled and believe in the Prophet. Okay, don't be fooled by their niceties and their sugarcoating. Because they, they don't sugarcoat when they talk about us. They call Allah Satan. They call Muslims killers. Look at the level of exaggeration. The absolute level of exaggeration. So now, let me turn on to another aspect of all of this, inshallah. I'm only going to touch on this right now, but I'll do a separate video just on this one point. For the first time in the new... <coughs> Judeo-Christian party to run in Israeli parliamentary elections. Now, what does that mean? This man that we were just watching is in the Israeli government. The one we were just watching, he's the one who wrote this book uh, called Return to Mecca, the Jewish Return to Mecca. He is uh, running a party that is a joint venture between Christians and Jews. Why is that important? Is because Jews are smaller in number, Christians are much larger in number, and many Jews, many, many Jews, have married into Christian families. But those Christians that have a Messianic view, and those Jews who have a Messianic view of the future, what is that Messianic view of the future? It is the destruction, to put it bluntly, of Islam by taking over Mecca and Medina. That is the great evil to them, and they justify it in different ways, but it is actually them that are the perpetrators. They're the actual doers. They create a, a fantasy villain that doesn't exist in their mind, and then actually physically go and shoot. Okay? So this, this is what happens to a person when they become psychotic. They create fantasies, but because they have a religion that they have made in, in the land into an idol, the land of Israel is their idol. They worship. They don't worship God. They don't worship the Ibrahim Alayhisalatuwasalam's God. Ibrahim's God had no land, right? And so, anyway, that's the whole thing being put aside. But the Jews that are going to migrate back to Israel, many of them are going to bring Christian families, and in that case, this will be easily become one of the largest. Jewish political organizations in Israel because right now Christians have no um, <coughs> Christians have no representation in Israel right now Muslims have small some you can say symbolic representation but Jews have representation mostly of course the different types of Jews 
and Christians have no representation at all. So now what will happen is there will be this Israeli party and it will create a, a Christian Jewish representation that is specifically messianic. And we know from the prophet and what he taught us that it is this messianic view, this false view of the future that looks factual on the ground. This false view of the future, this political party will become one of the largest influencers in Israel in the coming times. And let me tell you something. <coughs> if these Abrahamic Accords don't work, after all the Raku and Sujood the Muslim, Muslim leaders have given to Israel, and after Israel has used the Arab world to fight against Iran, and if suddenly after that the accords break, the peace treaty breaks, or if they do something to build their temple mount, and then just as they were peaceful, willingly peaceful, on give up on all your conditions and we will be peaceful to you, we will do trade with you because you need us and we don't need you, just as they were that you can say uh, conditionally nice, conditionally nice, just as they were. They will be unconditionally, unconditionally, unwaveringly your enemies and hurtful and uh, you could say evil to you with no conditions accepted now. We will come after you at all costs. If the Abrahamic Accords break, after this because this is like the last of the last attempt and if the Abrahamic Accords break which they will break according to what we see from the, what the Prophet said and also they will break according to what the Jews have been taught of their own Bible if you read Ezekiel Christians will also say the 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 Messianic Christians and Jews also say the Abrahamic Accords are not going to really work for a long time so <coughs> Here it is, brothers and sisters. The Jews have been in Arabia. They have lived in Arabia. It's part of their borders. So what is the purpose of the Abrahamic Accords? Its only purpose is to use the Arabs as a front against Iran. And then after they have accomplished that, they will get rid of what is no longer useful to them. And they will take over the lands of the Muslims because by that time, Muslims will be in the front lines against Iran. Israel will be in the back enjoying, giving them, you know, uh, strategic information to bring down Iran uh, through the satellites and so on and so forth. Israel will sit back, relax, continue to grow while the Muslims fight Iran. And uh, this will happen and you will see. But, uh, you know, and Israel might have some involvement. <coughs> but overall, this friendship which they call Abrahamic Accords, will come at a very dangerous cost. A very, very dangerous cost. And I'm going to talk more about that and how all this is now from where we're standing today. If you understand a few things, it all becomes, the picture is much more clear today than it was even before the pandemic. Today, if you read the Ahadith, it's much more clear today what is about to happen, especially with these Abrahamic Accords. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the Ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to really turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, know our priorities as an Ummah, as individuals, that this life is temporary. We're here just for a few days and we have to go to the next life. But are we going to be loyal to Allah while we're here? Or are we going to be loyal and worshipping and serving the forces of the shayateen while we are on earth for a few days. Aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimina wal-muslimat. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.